here with Lance Taylor, the Arnhold Professor of International Cooperation and Development at the New School of Social Research. He's got a new book out, Maynard's Revenge, The Collapse of Free Market Macroeconomics. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. So your book, let's talk about the title. What is Maynard's Revenge? Well, Maynard's Revenge would be the following, that uh, he was highly influential in economics up until around, let's say, 1960 and 1970, and then was completely overshadowed first by Milton Friedman and monetarism and subsequently by rational expectations. And one of the arguments in, in the book is that, is that this change in macroeconomic thinking ultimately was an extremely important underlying factor behind the crisis. Uh, and that way of thinking broke down, the collapse of free market macroeconomics broke down with the crisis. Uh, so in some sense, Maynard's revenge is that he was right after all. And, uh, and we suffered the consequences. And we suffered the consequences, yeah. Let's talk about your perceptions of Keynes thought and what you might call free market fundamentalist thought. Where, where do you see them differing? Well, Keynes, in my interpretation, basically said three or four terribly important things. One is that the uh, macroeconomic system is subject to what one can tell, call fundamental uncertainty. That, that is, we really cannot know a lot of what's going to happen in the future. Uh, or in Donald Rumsfeld's phrase, there are unknown unknowns about the future. And, and, uh, so we operate in that environment, and, and, and that is particularly important in financial markets. And so that was, I think, one terribly important point. A second point is, which he did not make so much of, but some of his followers, like Charles Kindleberger and Hyman Minsky, emphasized, is that there are two sets of prices in the capitalist system. There are, there are prices of goods and services, and which is what central bankers historic, historically have worried about. And there are prices of assets, and, and asset prices and the price of goods and services don't necessarily move together, as, as we saw in the run-up to the crisis. And that can have sort of strong effects on, on the way that, that the economy operates. Third is that uh, Keynes designed the basic framework for macroeconomics, the national income and product accounts. He did that, and it was preceded by the Swedes in, in the early 30s. But, but around 1940, he invented the system of national accounting that, that we use. And built into that system is an equality between uh, expenditure and income. That is, all everything that gets spent ultimately generates income, and income feeds around into expenditure. But the really driving force is expenditure. Spending creates income, and that's what creates jobs. And uh, the fundamental difference between Keynes and uh, mainstream economics is that mainstream economics reverse the causality, essentially saying that spending, essentially saying, excuse me, that income is determined from the supply side and by the available stocks of capital and labor and, and raw materials and things like that. You determine output from the supply side and then that gets spent automatically. And that's, Keynes called that says law or says law after an early 19th century French economist. And the distinction, the key distinction between, uh, between Keynes and, and the mainstream then is one key distinction is, is that for Keynes, Say's law is not valid and the level of economic activity is determined by demand. And the mainstream also believes, contrary to Keynes, that uh, one can perfectly well describe all future events in terms of known probability distributions to, to be a bit technical or, or, in, or in terms of risks of things that are known which are going to happen. Like a deck of cards. Like a deck you of cards, cards or, or, or dice. I use yeah. dice in the sure. book and, and, sure. and that's, uh, you know, you, you throw the dice, you know, you know the probabilities and that's right. well known. Keynes did not believe that. Uh, he actually wrote a treatise on probability uh, finished at around 1913, published in 1920 where he said that we just cannot put probability distributions up on the future. And, and that theme then recurred in his, in his major book, The General Theory, in, in 1936. So between the importance of fundamental uncertainty and the uh, absence of Say's law, there's a complete disjunction, really, between the kind of macroeconomics that Keynes was talking about in the general theory and the kind of macroeconomics that became a dominant in the 60s and 70s. Let's talk a little bit about the build-up to the crisis. 
how do you see what you might call this Keynesian framework uh, anticipating or being able to see into the imbalances and dangers that well, led to the crisis? You can see into the imbalances and dangers. I mean, and after all, economics, if you like, is historical science, and, and uh, economists are much better saying what happened in the past than, than talking about what's going to happen in the future. But that being said, uh, it was clear going into the crisis, even beginning as far back as 2000, that, that or even even the late 90s, that the whole financial system was was becoming highly imbalanced. And uh, there's another of Keynes' successors named Wynne Godley, who was sort of the Cassandra of macro, sort of started publishing papers in the late 90s, essentially saying, hey, look at all this household borrowing. It just can't go on, and, and uh, uh, something has got to give. And uh, it, it did ultimately give. But what happened, basically, is that uh, particularly with, 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 with the, first with the equity boom in the 90s and subsequently with, with the mortgage boom in, in, the, in the 2000s, is that on the one hand you have a group of assets, a set of assets for which asset prices are rising steadily. And uh, on the other hand, people want to buy into those assets. And the way to do that is to uh, essentially run up leverage, run up debt, which they then uh, buy, use to buy more asset. Asset prices go up further. That, given the arithmetic of leverage, that reduces, that reduces the leverage, so they have an incentive to go out and borrow more. I mean, it's an ever-rising spiral. And uh, this pattern was characteristic of the 29 crisis, uh, or the lead into, lead into the Great Depression. It was certainly characteristic of, of, the, uh, of, of the mortgage events in, in the 2000s. And that, uh, that's an old dynamic in financial markets. And people like Kindleberger and Minsky, more Kindleberger than Minsky, I would say, uh, really wrote about that. And uh, the evidence was on the table, but uh, people just chose not to look at it. We look at the, what you might say, the conditions leading to this leverage bubble, mm -hmm. and then it's breaking. Mm -hmm. Let me ask, uh, how would you restructure or recreate financial regulation to preempt or, or stop this bubble kind of behavior from emerging? I think one reason why the crisis propagated so strongly was that uh, why did people start running up all this mortgage borrowing? And why, why did households start to borrow so heavily? And the truth is, and this is a point that's also implicit in Keynesian thought, more in his earlier books than, than in a general theory, that, that income distribution is terribly important in shaping patterns of aggregate demand. And beginning in the 1980s, uh, there's been a clear, if you like, deterioration in the income distribution in the United States. You can, you can look at the size distribution and, and the uh, share in the, back in the 80s, the share of income going to the top 1% was like 9%, and now it's up above 25%. Uh, wage share of output went down very strongly. And uh, in effect, household real wage stagnated. And in fact, households found themselves in the position of being unable to uh, maintain living standards, growth in living standards to which they had been accustomed, except by the possibility of running up debt. So the interaction between the real side rise in inequality and the financial side uh, rise in, in debt and then securitization and, and, and all that kind of thing essentially gave rise to, to a major crisis. In the, how I say, uh, literature on, on the history of how income distribution affects aggregate demand, my sense is this interacts with, as you talked about it, the backward causation, that mm -hmm. if demand causes the activity and jobs and so mm -hmm. forth, as opposed to the supply side causing everything, mm -hmm. 
in the supply side model, you wouldn't care about income distribution because mm -hmm. everything would just add up to full employment. Yeah, the everything's fine and everybody's paid have. what they deserve. And right. <laughs> and, and the distribution of demand, even if the top made everything, wouldn't really affect aggregate demand right, yeah. because the savings would transmit into investment and right. what have you. Yeah. But in your modeling framework, that well, distribution of income, yeah, no, but I mean the one that you yeah, yeah. put together in your book, that income distribution is very important to the resilience of aggregate demand. Yeah, there, there are a couple of things there that, that I think, uh, again, come out of not, Keynes didn't say it himself, but it, it comes out of Keynesians. That there was a guy named Richard Goodwin who uh, got a got in trouble with McCarthy in, in the nineteen in the nineteen forties and Joseph McCarthy. Well, it's Joseph in McCarthy, yes, okay. yes, and I'm joined by A. Shearer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, he ended up moving to, to Cambridge, England, uh, where he constructed the model of cyclical growth, with, which is uh, sort of very strongly influ influenced by Marx as well. And basically what he argued is that uh, there's a natural cycle in, in uh, or the way his argument has been extended is to argue that there's a natural cycle in the U.S. economy, which says that you come out of a slump, uh, productivity tends to go up uh, because firms don't hire immediately. And then this productivity increase feeds into profits, which is supposed to feed into an increase in investment. And that's one of the factors that, that uh, tends to pull the American economy, at least, out of, out, of, out of a recession. Now, we're seeing the shift toward profits in the present circumstances, quite clearly. And there was a big productivity jump, as usual, coming out of the, coming out of the recession. But uh, so far, that hasn't gone very strongly into investment demand. And uh, maybe it's because American firms feel they don't have to invest in this country if they can outsource, outsource things. And, Foreign and, direct investment rather than yeah, domestic right. investment. Yeah. So that, that's one factor which is sort of holding back the recovery. A second factor is that it, uh, there was another guy, Wynne Godley, whom I already mentioned, uh, who extended Keynesian accounting uh, to worry about uh, how income and expenditure uh, balance across sectors, that, that is, uh, for the entire economy, income has to equal expenditure. That, that was Keynes's postulate. Uh, but uh, for any institutional sector, so to speak, uh, investment can exceed saving or income can exceed spend expenditure. So that, that, uh, that sector is borrowing. And another sector, its uh, income can exceed its expenditure, and that sector is lending. Yeah, net savings in the business sector, but dis-savings in the household sector. Or yeah, but, but what happens in, in all previous cycles, if, if you sort of apply a framework that, that was designed by Godley, is that uh, what's led the economy out of a recession has been an upswing in household net borrowing. And essentially that net borrowing has gone into housing investment. And with housing investment dead in the water at this point in time, that, that impetus will not be That uh, impetus like will that. not be there. That reminds me of Richard Koo's work on uh, balance sheet recessions where mm -hmm. the overhang upon the downturn mm -hmm. in the household sector mm -hmm. leads people just to want to retire debt, yeah, not right. to use new money at the margin to yeah, enliven right. the real economy. Yeah, right. Well, that's the, the other side of the coin I was talking about, basically. Mm -hmm. and, uh, You don't sound particularly optimistic about. Uh, the I'm not. I mean, short there's term. obviously going to be some kind of recovery, and, and if if, in, if investment picks up the uh, if private investment picks up the, the there there's some shot at it. The other thing that became quite important after I finished the book that that is I, I finished the book last January, almost or really last April at the last gasp, and what I didn't pick up uh, is this reappearance of, of what uh, Keynes in the 1930s called the Treasury View, which is really the notion that uh, the, uh, you should have fiscal rectitude and, and uh, forget about countercyclical uh, interventions, countercyclical spending. And uh, this, uh, so you see that in, in the sort of fears 
that unless we pursue austerity, we're going to be attacked by the bond, bond vigilantes riding down from the hillside. Or, or maybe <laughs> really, the <this laughs> onset of this was the Greek crisis, uh, where anxiety about Greece yeah. led to fears about sovereign debt uh, solvency. Yeah, well, that 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 certainly exacerbated it. But there, yeah. there, 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 you know, there was this whole view that that uh, the, what you have to do is be fiscally correct, and and the resurgence of that. I mean. There was this spurt of Keynesianism coming out of the crisis. Led by Gordon Brown in the formation of the G20. And yes, led by Gordon yeah. Brown, yeah. Uh, may he rest in peace. And, and uh, mm -hmm. But uh, at the Chinese, for God's sakes, the, the Chinese were. That's right. They did a very substantial <laughs> they Keynesian did a very substantial policy. Keynesian uh, as a percent of GDP, well, it was the largest in the yeah. world, I believe. Yeah. That's right. So, so you know, that Keynesianism worked in that sense. I mean, at least it forestalled a depression. And uh, that uh, was succeeded beginning in early 2010. The Greek crisis certainly added to it by, by this notion that what we have to pursue is fiscal rectitude. And the striking thing, again, if, if you look at these net borrowing flows, is, is, is that the government always borrows countercyclically. Mm -hmm. That is, tax returns go down and, and you start having a bit more unemployment insurance being paid out. That kind government of thing. dis savings offsets the government cost of the business and household sectors. Exactly, and, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, that's built into the system, but, but somehow that that sort of cyclical effect is built into the system. But people are effectively ignoring that. And then they're also ignoring the sort of very Keynesian notion, the very Keynesian notion that, that probably in, 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 in a longer period of time that uh, fiscal stimulus can, in fact, support a higher rate of growth. And you can do some simple-minded econometrics about those two things and, and uh, come up with, uh, with, with a fairly plausible description of how the U.S. economy behaves. The, well, the final thought I have is that as we look at new economic thinking, it is often characterized to me by conservatives that maybe free market fundamentalism broke down with the financial crisis. And maybe the full employment saves law approach is wrong, but we still don't trust in the government. We don't trust the government to correct things. And after the, the financial bailouts, when many people felt that in unlike in the environmental movement where they say the polluter pays, mm -hmm. the polluted paid the polluters who went back to paying bonuses. Exactly. The resentment of government officials for being the, what you might say, administer of that system mm -hmm. leaves many American people, at least, and, and I think in other places around the world to some degree, concerned that government spending is now the, what you might call, insurance agency for the powerful and that you can't do Keynesian spending because it, the population doesn't believe it's credible. They don't believe it will materialize. I agree with, again with a lot of what you're saying, but but uh, on the other hand, there's this notion that, that, that the government has to behave like a household. That uh, That is, if you want to pay the bills and leave something for the kids. Yeah, and balance your books. <laughs> and, yeah. That is, you, you cannot have your expenditure exceed your income uh, for an indefinite period of time. The government can. It has that power. And if the government doesn't exercise that power, then, then it seems to me that, that uh, Keynes's great worry was, was that the world would be stuck in stagnation. and, and uh, which writing in the 1930s, I think, was a perfectly appropriate point of view. He, he did not anticipate so-called military Keynesianism and, and, and all of that in World War II. But, but if the government actually starts thinking that it's a household, uh, then we're in for a lot of trouble. And uh, I think the fiscal conservatives, of which there are many stripes, but many of them uh, just don't grasp that message. And uh, so that that conceptual inhibition, yeah, is important to as a I would say a limitation on the scope of what a government could do. Yeah, but whatever it could do, other conservatives say it won't do that. It's regulatory capture or 
it's uh, well, yeah, maybe it is regulatory capture. Maybe they've been captured. One could certainly argue that in, in, in the current administration, but, but uh, I don't see that there's much other hope. Well, thank you for uh, coming visiting with us today. Your book, Maynard's Revenge, is certainly uh, provocative, exciting, well-reasoned, and uh, I, uh, I thank you for nourishing us with, all with it. And, uh, Look forward to seeing you again. Okay. Well, thank you very much.